Brian Height, PhD, is an individual with varied interests and eclectic experiences. As a grown-up, he has worked as a stuntman in over 130 movies and episodes of TV shows, a performance psychology consultant for the U.S. Army, and a senior dissertation chair at Grand Canyon University. Currently, Brian co-hosts a podcast called Poking Holes in Blinders. He owns and operates a sports performance psychology coaching and consulting business and continues to hit the ground as a stuntman each time the opportunity arises. Brian has authored one book called Begin Again, Utilize the Wisdom of Eastern and Western Ideologies to Achieve Your Full Potential, and is working to complete, hopefully by the end of this year, 2023, his second and third books on mental strength for entrepreneurs. Along the way, in all of these adventures, Brian has achieved a bachelor's in psychology, a master's in sports psychology, and a PhD in organizational psychology. He's a certified mental performance consultant through the Association of Applied Sports Psychology and has spent the last 15 years helping athletes, performers, and U.S. Army soldiers develop the mental strength resources necessary for them to perform to their potentials and navigate life's challenges to the best of their abilities. When not working, Brian can be found shooting pool, riding motorcycles, dirt bikes, or street bikes, reading, writing, practicing magic, mostly card tricks, and or playing with his kids. What will the future bring for Brian? He says he has no idea. And that's kind of the fun part. It is. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Brian. Let's start with how you got into sports and then into stunts, which is really cool, and how it led you into what you do mainly now, I assume, which is the sports psychology. Yeah, well, okay, so let's start with with the sports. I mean, I don't know, I've always been an active kid, but around seven is when I started organized sports and I started playing soccer. Next year, picked up baseball. The next year, did a little wrestling along with the baseball and the soccer and and just continued that up through the end of high school. I never competed at any high level in any sports. I did do travel teams and I made all-stars and, you know, I mean, just the the basics in regular organized sports, but I never competed in college, never competed in pros, anything like that. I just stayed active and did a lot of things. And that activity and that doing a lot of things actually became very helpful in the stunts, which, you know, you were asking about. I I ended up seeing a stunt show in... I guess the first time I saw it, it was New Jersey. It was New Jersey. It was the the summer after my sophomore year of college. I happened to know the the company manager of the Batman stunt show at the Six Flags up there. And I was going to college at Rutgers. And so as soon as I got back to school for my junior year, I went to Six Flags with a friend of mine and and saw this show. And it was fantastic. I, I couldn't even believe that people were being paid to do this stuff. It was really incredible. And, and so I started talking to the guys and just asked, you know, how do you get into this? And they told me, you know, you have to learn how to do fights, high falls and motorcycles. So I linked up with one of the guys and he taught me how to do fights and high falls. I bought a motorcycle and I practiced on it for a year, went to the audition, got the, got the job in the show. And and then that was the beginning. I, I did that show for that summer. And then the summer after that, in New Jersey, Moved out to L.A., did uh, the same show and then a few other subsequent shows out in L.A. while getting into film and TV. And uh, I really attribute that that variety of athletic activity that I had when I was a kid because it, it was it was really I mean, if, if there was a ball, I would play it. If it didn't involve a ball, I didn't really wasn't really interested. But volleyball, baseball, basketball, tennis. It really soccer, like I said, uh, I never I never did play football in an organized way because my mom wouldn't let me. She thought it was too dangerous. <laughs> and then I started doing stunts. But right? um, <laughs> but I did play football with friends, you know, out in the yard or wherever, where we happen to find ourselves. So it was a, the in, in terms of athletics, 
I really only focused on soccer and baseball in an organized setting, but I played everything and I loved everything. And I think all of that was beneficial in that, in that shift to stunts of just being versatile and, and being able to adapt to whatever circumstances they happen to throw at you for whatever job you happen to be on. So touching on that, just before we move into the psychology part, do you think, <laughs> I always assume that somebody who is a stuntman needs kind of a lack of fear. Is that, is there any truth to that? Because it seems like a lot of the stuff that you guys are called to do is super scary and takes a lot of courage. Yeah, it, it's funny. I have a podcast too. It's called Poking Holes and Blinders. And in two of the episodes that we did, I do with a friend of mine, his name's Colin Fallenweider. Um, in two of our episodes, we talked to two stunt people, very you know well known. They they've been in the business forever, and fear came up in both situations. It is absolutely something that that can't be done without if you're going to be a successful stunt person. It, it is absolutely essential that you have a healthy level of fear, and and <laughs> that you're able to regulate and manage that fear. Uh, in whatever situations you find yourself. So the absence of fear would be a very, very bad thing. And and it's truly a red flag to to many of us in, in the business and, and stunt coordinators as well. If if you hear somebody tell you, I'm not afraid, I'm never afraid, I have no fear. Well, then mm. I don't need you. <laughs> I right. don't need you on my set. I don't want to be around you. You're dangerous. And, and I don't want dangerous. I want to do my job. And I want to go home at the end of the night in the same condition that I showed up this morning. And people without fear put that situation at risk. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Because from a liability standpoint, you want a professional who knows the danger and the risk and make sure that you're mitigating each and every variant that you can like to keep yourself and everybody else on the set safe I imagine yeah it, it it is it is the fear the fear is something that that it does it it keeps you safe it, it you don't want it to be so strong and I'd say that this is true in life I, I'd say that fear keeps you safe it's an it's a it is a helpful and adaptive and useful emotion however it can run away from you just like any other emotion. It it it, it reminds me of uh, of Aristotle's concept of the golden mean. So the Aristotle talked about virtues and the fact that too much or too little, even of a virtue, it it turns into a vice. So you want to be right in the middle. You want you want that happy medium, the goldy the Goldilocks version of of the virtues. And I think fear is the same way. I think that that honestly, probably any emotion, a good argument could be made that somewhere in that middle ground is the right place to be. And so the fear, yeah, it keeps you safe. And it's very useful under certain circumstances. If you don't have enough of it, you're going to get hurt. And if you have too much of it, you're going to miss out on a lot of experiences and a lot of fun stuff that, that you know, you could have done otherwise. So yeah. that's how I think about fear. I imagine that fear is something that comes up a lot in your work with athletes and performers in your psychology work. So let's, let's, let's talk about a little bit of that, of how you decided to go into the field of psychology and, you know, some of the things that come up. Cause I know fear is like, it'll cause people to over try. It'll cause people to underperform, you know, all those things. I'm sure that's something that you work with at times with your athletes and clients. Yeah. Fear and anxiety. It's a, you know, an offshoot of, of fear uh, fear being perceiving some threat in the immediate environment that's that's making you nervous. Anxiety is more about the future and being worried about the bad things that might happen out there. But they they come from the same family. Yeah, those are those are big topics in the sports psychology world. To just back up a little bit and answer your question about how I got there, I you know I I was introduced to psychology as a senior in high school in a psychology class I took at my high school and was immediately hooked. It was really fascinating to me, all the different areas with memory and cognition and emotions and and perception and and just a whole gamut that, that psychology is. It's not just, and this is this is a misconception I think that a lot of people have. Psychology is not just about put somebody on a couch and talk to them in therapeutic settings. It's it's 
way more than that. It encompasses so much. And I had no idea until I took that class and it was, it really intrigued me. So I, when I went to college, I majored in psychology and, uh, and just that interest continued to grow. Then I dropped out of college with one semester to go to move to LA and be a stunt man. <laughs> And so, you know, but but the interest in psychology never left. The interest in how people think and just that intrigue about what's what makes a mind work, mine and everybody else's, uh, it, it never went away. And then there was a time when I was I started coaching gymnastics. Now I was never a gymnast, but I did pick up some gymnastics along the way that was very helpful in in the stunts. And while picking it up, I also learned how to coach it, and I'd coached kids in many settings. So one thing led to another and I was coaching gymnastics. And while I was coaching gymnastics, these kids that I was coaching, they were they were learning the skills and and they could do the skills. And I watched it happen on a daily basis. And then I took them to a meet and some of them would would exceed beyond expectations and some would tank miserably. And I couldn't tell which there seemed to be no relationship almost between how they performed at practice and how they performed at the competition. So again, fascinated in that because there was obviously physically they could do it. I'd watched it happen. But when they got to the competition, it was very different. And the only explanation for that was mental. So I started reading more about sports psychology and, and delving more deeply into how the, the mental aspect of performance affects the physical aspect of performance and how the two go together. And uh, that led me to the to the masters. I had finished my bachelor's at that point, just and that's the whole story in and of itself. But I got it done, and and then I went on with the masters in sports psychology, finished that, and just wasn't finished. I wasn't finished learning. I enjoyed the material, continued on with the PhD in organizational psychology, which is essentially sports psychology for businesses. But um, but that's that was the path and never with the intention of actually working in the field. I really enjoyed stunts. I thought that I'd be doing stunts forever. I'd just do stunts and I'd be a stunt coordinator and I'd retire in stunts. And and this psychology thing was just a, a hobby. It was just an avocation that I kind of, I don't know, I just enjoyed exploring and, and applying in coaching settings when I happened to find myself there. Well, next thing you know, I was at, you know, find myself at the army as a in a performance psychology role for them as a consultant and I did that for a couple of years went back to stunts again and then back to the army again for another for uh, I guess it was nine years that time wow doing the performance psychology and resilience training so there's there's the traditional sports psychology of how do we get our mind right so that we perform to our potential in the moment and then there's resilience coming at it from the standpoint of at least this is the way I come at it it, the provision of resources and tools that people can leverage and use regardless of what setting they happen to find themselves in. It's just stuff that that can be protective in the sense that when the inevitable bad, inevitable bad things happen, uh, they don't knock us down quite as far. And they can be tools where, you know, if we get knocked down far, we're able to recover more quickly. And not only that, but this is this is important to get better as a result of going through those challenges in the first place, learning and 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 becoming wiser from our experiences so that, you know, each experience we have, whether it be good or bad, we're coming out of it better than we went into it. Absolutely. So, so that's that's kind of the pathway into sport performance psychology that that I've taken and uh, and and continue to take. So like you said, I have my own business. Begin again, performance psychology. I work with athletes. I work with performers. I work with with business people, entrepreneurs. In fact, I've got two books I'm finishing up right now: Mental Strength for Entrepreneurs. So I work with that population as well. Uh, in addition to still doing stunts. So when I quit the full-time job with the army, that allowed me to, to pick back up stunts again. So I made some phone calls to some friends, linked back up. And, and once we get off strike, I'll be able to start oh, working on shows yeah, again. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. So a lot to unpack and all the things you just shared, but before we go into back into the psychology thing, cause I have a huge interest in the mental game and sports psychology as well. What's the most what is the coolest stunt that you ever have performed? Like what's your, 
the coolest experience as a stuntman. Hmm. That's an interesting question. <laughs> it's not usually phrased that way. Uh, <laughs> usually the, the question is, what's the craziest stunt you ever did? Or, uh, you know, something I just like think that. The, it, the experiential thing is more important to me because it might not be, it may not. I know having been a performer my whole life that a lot of things in movies, especially it appears one way, but it's another, it's totally another way entirely. So that's why I ask, like, what did you find to be the coolest experience? Like that was badass. I just yeah. did that. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, two come to mind, but for very different reasons. I, I, but both on the same show. I'll take two. Let's weirdly go. enough. Um, <laughs> one is I, I, well, I guess I'll do a different show. So it, it, it's one was on a film called drive angry. And it was, it was a car hit, but there were two of us getting hit by the same car, one right after the other. That's rare. Car hits are, are pretty, I mean, they can be very dangerous stunts and, and, and they take a lot of preparation and to, to hit two people with the cars that, that doesn't happen often, but it was what we Wait, did. A in car this hit case. you hit your body. Physically? Yeah. That's what a car oh. hit is, is when a car is okay. driving and it just hits the person and you go, you go flying, flying up and over. Okay. I was picturing case, you in a car, but until you said two of us getting hit and I'm like, Oh boy. No, no. I, I went, I, I was a crazy person. If you ever see that movie there, it's at the end, there are a bunch of people in a compound and, and uh, I don't know why we're crazy, but we are. And, and this car jumps over the wall, crashes through this burning sign, lands in the compound and just starts driving around hitting the crazy people. But the crazy people aren't running away from it. We went to go tackle the car. So I I dove at the car and the car hit me. I went flying over. But here's the thing. The car was on fire. So as we're getting hit by the car, we're all getting lit on fire too. So that was what made that gag so cool is that it was, we had to time it out where there were two of us. Because as soon as I was on the windshield, the other guy was like, I went on the windshield and just came off. And that's when the hood hit him. So the timing was really important. And the fire aspect was important because I had to figure out kind of where I was going to land so the safety guys could be there with the fire extinguishers. And the same thing happened with the other guy. And for every person who's on fire, you have a minimum of two to three people ready to put them out. So that meant there were four to six people you had to play somewhere where the camera could. It was a big involved thing a lot. that made it a lot of fun. So that was one. And then the other really had very little risk to it at all. And really required no skill whatsoever, but it was a very cool moment. I, I was working on Hawaii Five O, and the shot was standing on top of this this building. I don't know what it was. It was a Marriott Hotel, maybe, but it was high. It was, I mean, two hundred fifty feet in in the air. It was it was way up there, and I was standing on the very edge. So I say it didn't take any skill because I stand up every day. And I, and I say there was no risk because I was cabled off. They had a they had a wire attached to my to my waist that was attached to something else. So I wasn't going to fall off. But I'm standing on the edge of this building, just looking down. Yeah, no, I'm out. Fifty feet <laughs> and out across. That's the part that made it so cool. So when you said cool, that's that's what it was. Yeah. I was just standing on the edge of this building. That's one of the tallest buildings on Oahu looking out over the whole island and the ocean and just all this. Mm. It was just a. It was just really was a cool experience, not for any risk or talent or skill. It was just a moment that that sticks with me. Moments matter. And that probably is I've got this place um, that I visit sometimes in my dreams. That was a kind of like a cliff in Alaska when I was working on cruise ships in Alaska and we climbed up and it was just this beautiful view, kind of probably like what you're describing that just sometimes comes back like, ah, how cool that moment. You know, yeah, those are those are our great moments. I had a place like that when I was in college. I would climb up on the roof of of our dorm and just I was the only one there, and it allowed me to just kind of take in nature. I don't know if everybody's like that, but I think probably most of us are just as human beings. Just that just, I don't know moments where we can just be. I don't know, feeling a little bit separated from, or maybe that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Maybe even more a part of. Yeah. Uh, with with nature and the world and just things that are larger than we are. 
High five on that. I think anybody that doesn't feel connected to that type of thing just hasn't experienced it yet. So they just don't know. I think, you know, we could go down a whole rabbit hole of connectedness, but let's stay with peak performance <laughs> for today. So I found a quote on your website, which I found really interesting and intriguing and which I'd love to delve into, which you say peak performance occurs when we are strong and whole in all areas of our lives. So that being said, do you find that when you do your work with athletes, performers, business people, whatever, that a lot of times what's holding someone back, for example, those gymnasts you were mentioning, it's not the skill, it's not the ability, it's usually some other stuff that we have to work through. Yeah, that that occurs often. And the quote you're referring to, when I say whole, the philosophy and approach that I take in the work that I do, I, I identify five aspects of human beings, physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual. And to me, we can talk about them separately, because kind of that's, that's what you sort of have to do to get a handle on on them and what what you mean by each but they operate holistically they operate together they operate synergistically they if you're moving the needle on one you're moving the needle on the other you, you can't not so any physical changes that are happening i'm going to it's going to affect the way that i think it's going to affect my emotional uh, my emotions and anybody who works out knows that if you work out hard you work your body very hard it changes the way you think it changes your your uh your emotional state and, and vice versa. If if you, you're getting worked up, you're getting very angry or frustrated, you can feel that in your body. There's muscle tension that occurs and and your perception narrows, especially with, with negative emotions. Your, your attention narrows. So it, it affects the way we think and perceive. There is no way to move the needle on one that doesn't move the needle on all the others. So that's what I mean by that peak performance. Yes, it, it it encompasses all of those. All those things have to be hitting in order for us to be at our best. So in the work that I do with my clients, yeah, a lot of them show up thinking we're going to talk about thinking and, and the mind and that's it. That's where we're going. But often that's not the problem. And even outside of that, they also think we're going to talk about their activity. If they're swimmers, we're going to talk about swimming. If it's gymnastics, we're going to talk about gymnastics. But for example, when I work with high school kids, what, what I have dealt with them it, it are the, the SATs and the ACTs. So they'll complain about being stressed out or being unable to focus at practice or being very volatile emotionally at meets. And really what it comes down to is they've just got that added stressor of this this pressure that they feel from scoring a certain thing on a test that will allow them to be eligible for the colleges that they want to go to. So, so it, ha it has nothing to do with swimming, but it's this outside thing is affecting swimming. Where it's, so all of that stuff works together. If any one of those things is is out of whack, for example, even the social, if somebody's having a fight with a spouse or a significant other or just some friends or feels ostracized or not a part of whatever group they happen to be in, that social component will affect them emotionally, mentally, and ultimately physically in terms of their energy level and what they're able to put out. So that's, I appreciate you pulling that quote out because that does encapsulate the philosophy that I, and, and approach that I try to take with whatever client I'm working with. Yeah, there's definitely, there's so many layers and of psychology to everything that we do. And I've, I've gone down the rabbit hole, especially lately in, in working in breath work and how like a lot of the trauma and a lot of our stress and pressure is trapped in the body and ways that you, you can't really think yourself out of it. Sometimes you have to physically work yourself out of it, which is again, going back to what you said, why physical exercise sometimes releases some of our tension stored in our body when we need to like get rid of energy. Um, so so going back to like what you said about the SATs on a kid. So there's this pressure. This kid is an athlete, high performing athlete, the pressure of the SATs and what, you know, that means for them. And even deeper, like, why is that so important? Is it because mom and dad are putting pressure? Like, is it because society is all like, there's so many layers to why we show up the way that we do. That's why I think it's so important for 
any athlete or high performer or someone who wishes to be a high performer should find someone like you to work on the mental aspect of the game. Because in the work that I do, that's the big question. Like, so how much of your sport or your task or activity would you say is mental? And most people will say like a lot. And then you ask them, how much effort do you put, how much time, money, energy do you put into the mental aspect of your game? Most people don't. And when high achievers find someone like you or some other competitive edge to help them where they know they can succeed better, it's almost always locked up in the mental game. And it's, you know, we all think that it's just, I need to work harder. I need to do this more. And it's sometimes just one little key that you don't even know that that door is locked until like you said, you'll talk to this athlete say, Oh, so you're wigged out about the SATs next week. No wonder you're performing poorly. Like, you know, there's so many Mm -hmm. um, aspects. What do you think was the moment you realized that the mental piece was the key to helping these groups of people? Uh, I don't know that there was a moment, but that, that, (laughs) <laughs> but that realization that I would told you about before with the gymnasts, I mean, that, yeah. that was a big one. And then I guess it, it really emerged. And by it, I mean that, that realization that the mental piece, it, it shouldn't be ignored and really can't be ignored. If, if you're going to try to be at your best, uh, it, the more I learned, the clearer that became not just from a theoretical and knowledge standpoint, but whatever I learned, I put into practice with stunts and, and eventually mm-hmm. with everything else in my life. Cause it, it started again with sports psychology. So, I was, Oh, sports athletics, this, I can take this and I can use it in stunts and I can make myself better. And yes, you can absolutely. But with a little bit more learning and a little bit more time under my belt with, with the application of these things, I realize that they can be applied to way more things than just that one performance. That's 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 a way to practice some of this stuff. That's a way to get some experience using these skills and concepts, and you'll see benefit from it for sure. But it is not the only one. Uh, it, this this stuff is relevant throughout life, and and so I guess there's there wasn't a moment. It has been a continual continual learning process about exactly when and how and what uh these different skills can affect in various yeah, areas and, and as we progress as as a species of humans and keep un- uncovering more complicated things about the brain it's just so fascinating right um so question for you that people often ask is how can someone like yourself use what you teach to athletes? Because it really makes sense to people when you talk about a mental game for athletes or performers, because they have this specific task. How does that translate over to business people? Mm. I know the answer, but I want to hear you tell people the answer of why what you do for athletes also works in a very generalized way for. Yeah. Well, Athletes and business people are people at the end of the day. That's what they are. And so therefore we have physical, mental, emotional, social, spiritual components that need to all be hitting in order for us to be at our best in whatever we're doing. And it truly is whatever we're doing. If if it can be a specific situation. So for example, if I need to have an important conversation with my kid or with my significant other, that's a moment in which some of these skills and concepts can be useful it can be broader than that in, in just, you know, as a leader in my, in my environment, this is a way that I want to be. So these are some of the concepts that are relevant and things that I should bring on a daily basis. So it can be situation task specific. It can be broader than that. But at the end of the day, all it is that I try to help people get in touch with and be able to, um, uh, I guess more consistently maximize are those five areas. And, and that's what I try to do. So whether it be in a business setting or an athletic setting, really the only thing that changes is the answer to what is success for you? How do you define success? You know, and that's really what it comes down to. And, and even with athletes to go back to what you were talking about before it, that's, 
that's a big part of it is is this uh how do we define success is success beating somebody else is success doing better than i did the time before is success uh recognizing a growth emotionally mentally i don't know physically even from time to time or or season to season it it really some people believe that that definition of success even in athletics where it seems so straightforward where there are podiums and medals and trophies it seems so straightforward it doesn't have to be that that doesn't have to be the definition of success whether you walk away with a trophy or you didn't or if you placed in whatever you know at the competitions and this is a lesson that I try to try to talk to my daughter about all the time. She's 10. She's a rock climber now. She did play soccer for a long time. Now she's into rock climbing. I say a long time. She's 10. So she <laughs> hasn't done anything for a long time. But uh, but at the moment, rock climbing is what she's what she's doing. And she's very passionate about it. And she loves it. But I, I try to let her know all the time. OK, well, what is success today? What is it that you want to do? And And how can we put those in put that uh into terms that she has more control over so placing in the top three bad way to define success because i can't control who else is at the competition or how well or badly they do um definitions of success how you know on a scale of one to ten how much was i able to overcome my anxiety or deal with my anxiety and nervousness right before I got on the wall. That's a great definition of success. She can rank herself on that. She has some tools to deal with it, something that she can control. She knows she's going to experience the anxiety. It's not going to be a surprise. So what do you do in that situation and how well do you do it? So those definitions of success, I think are important, but back to that athlete business thing. So then it's just a business person just has a different definition of what success looks like on a situation moment to moment level and maybe a broader level than does an athlete. But at the end of the day, we're all people. And so these same concepts and techniques that work in one environment work in the other two. And, you know, the other thing is we're not just business people or just athletes. We're all, I mean, we, we, we cross, we cross, cross genres. We wear a lot of different hats and, and these techniques can benefit us even even across all the, the circumstances and labels that we happen to put on ourselves. Yes. Wow. There was a lot going on in that moment of <laughs> what you said. First of all, I will say I had anxiety imagining myself as a 10 year old looking at a rock climbing wall in a comp competitive environment. I was like, Ooh, a little twinge of anxiety there. I'm a, I've definitely, I have a fear of heights. So that kind of stuff. Although like this year, as a matter of fact, interestingly enough, has been a year that I've been leaning into emotions like that. Um, you'll hear people say lean into it. And this year I've really been leaning into it. Like example, my husband and I went to this, um, fancy high-end water park at a resort and the one that goes straight down you know that drop that's like right off the edge that has always terrified me and we went and I was like I went first and I was like three two one YOLO and just went and and then all of a sudden what you realize is it's not even that scary that was actually pretty cool let's do it again you know so anyways leaning into fear but definitely that is what you're saying about we're all people is so, so, so true that we look at athletes and high performers and all of the people we see on TV and social media and all the things in their realm of success and think that they are superstars and they may very well be. And that doesn't mean they don't have a bunch of stuff going on behind the scenes like we all do when we all have to show up for whatever our, our highlight task is, um, let's say NBA basketball players that are out there and they train and train and train and they've done it their whole lives. That doesn't mean they don't have something going on with their kids or their spouse or their organization or their health behind the scenes. And the key, what, what sounds like you're talking about, Brian, is to find someone to help you make sure you can navigate all those things to be optimal in that moment of highlight shine so that you can be as focused and in the zone 
as you want to be. And it's a hard, it's a hard thing to do. I've worked on it a lot. Um, people think that it comes magically to me and I will say that it doesn't, it comes with a lot of work as I know, you know, and as your, your clients know that in order to get to a place where you can go into the zone at will and perform at your optimal peak or the best you can that day, it takes a process and it takes a plan. You yeah. can't just hope for the best. Well, yeah. And, and, and I think that this goes back to something you were talking about earlier too. It, many people, if you, especially at the very, at the highest levels, it is, it is widely acknowledged. It's not a secret at all that at the highest, highest levels, at the elite levels uh, for sure in sports, but I'd argue in anything, the difference is mental. There is no difference. Take athletes just specifically. There is no difference physically. They're all, they are all physical specimens that have that have trained. Their bodies are in shape. They have access to these these coaches and these workout and and the training and the knowledge. Physically, there is very little variance among those at the highest level, but some consistently win and some don't. And 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 that difference is mental. It's it's how well they are able to do what you're talking about to, to, I don't like to say block out distractors. I like to focus more on what we do rather than what we avoid, but focusing in on what's important in this moment and not just the, where do I put my eyes like part of attention, but how do I center myself completely in this moment to ensure that my energy levels are what they need to be that my physical breathing muscle tension is all what it needs to be, that my attention is is wide if it needs to be wide, narrow if it needs to be narrow, flexible and and adaptive and being able to shift, uh, that my mind is open and and capable of of thinking and problem solving and and uh, processing information. All of these things are so important. So it's about how do we get ourselves in a place where we can do those things rather than blocking out. So that's that's how I like to conceptualize that. But many people just believe it happens. Like you said, it just happens. If you just practice enough, you just do it enough. You just get enough experience, just figure it out. And you know what? Some people do figure it out. I don't know. First of all, I don't know that that figuring out is the most efficient way of doing things. And I'm not even sure it's the most effective way of doing things. Because when we figure stuff out, we figure it out in a way that that works for us as well as we know you know i mean we, we've got it it's like okay well this this is pretty good i've got myself there but what else is possible we don't know what other things if we were to learn from other people that we could apply that may even work better than what we've come up with on our own fumbling through the dark you know we don't know ab about that but that's an important thing to to consider um because, you know, the, the analogy when I was working with the army that I used to use is, is, look, you wouldn't take somebody, if you were trying to teach somebody how to shoot, you wouldn't take them out to a range, drop them off with a truckload of ammo and just say, figure it out. Good luck. You know? I mean, you just, you just wouldn't do that. You would provide them with information, with guidance, with coaching about how you do what you do. And then you give them experience. Then you can practice with some periodic coaching and mentals, the, the mental skills are no different from that. You get some information up front, you get some knowledge about the concepts, the the tools, and then you go try them out. And they're either going to work or they're not. And probably they're not as well as they could the first time around, because why their skills when you haven't developed them yet. So then you get a little coaching and you can improve. And through experience and time and the consistent application, then you get better. Then you start seeing the results. It's almost like, too, then another analogy that I use, there are two. One is pool and one is bowling. Because bowling, you can do pretty well just throwing the ball down the middle of the thing. You'll score in the 180s maybe if you do that pretty well. But as soon as you start learning how to curve the bowling ball, well, now, you know, your score can go into the 200s and up to up to 300. But it's going to go down initially because you're going to throw that ball in the gutter a lot. So if you're used to 180, you're going down to 70, <laughs> you know, but then it will consistently build up. The use of mental skills is the same way. Uh, it pool the example is you can hit a cue ball in the middle and, and just use angles to, to make the balls and you'll do pretty well. But as soon as you start learning how to use English to spin the cue ball, to, to put the cue ball where you want it, the balls go flying off the table. You're going to miss all kinds of shots until you figure it out. 
And then your game will improve way over and above what it was before. Mental skills work the same way. If we haven't ever tried to implement these things intentionally and deliberately, you can expect the, the implementation, this, this introduction of something new to the way you've always done things to make things worse initially. <laughs> However, <laughs> with, uh, again, that consistency and with that perseverance through some of those initial challenges, then you start to see over time, and, and some skills are more easily implemented than others. Some truly are just to look, if you do it, you're going you're gonna to be better. Others take more time. But if you commit to it and you really, if you really put those things consistently into practice, you will see, see a difference. You can't not. So that's, I don't know, that's a long way of answering what it was that you <laughs> asked me. I don't even ago. know what I asked, but yes to all that. <laughs> I mean, definitely what I think that most, whether whatever the, the pursuit the goal is to be able to have that consistent performance under pressure on demand, because it, like what you're saying, if you're just figuring it out on your own, it might not be duplicatable and you want to be able to duplicate it every time that you perform a task, whether it be, you know, shooting a free throw or making a sales call and you want to be able to feel consistent. And that's, I think what a lot of people strive for that they, they're like, why can't I get this free throw? And they don't realize that they need to work on the mental game and having a coach like Brian or any type of mental coach can help. It definitely, every coach that you have can give you that help of a, like a 30,000 foot view when the actual client performer is, is down here in the trees. Like the coach can help you see the forest for the trees and see how to make it more consistent. Yeah. It really is something that, that, People, what I get a lot of times from athletes too is is ones that they just haven't. It's like their first time ever having a problem. They've they've throughout their careers have kind of coasted, and 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 now all of a sudden for some reason and they don't know what it is, their things are hard and and they can't just generate the the same drive and energy and or even care. The motivation goes down. Um, they're just not having fun like they used to. There, there's, there are all these things. Interesting. Some of those kind of come with at certain periods of time. So for example, uh, moving in the 12 to 13 range for kids, that's when cognitive, they, they move, their cognitive abilities shift and change. The socially things are a little bit different. And, and many of them who played sports as kids, they'll, they'll stop. That's a big transition point for mm. kids. Also that move from high school to college. Some make it, some don't. And, and that junior year-ish of trying to figure out, all right, am I going to do it? Am I going to go for it? Am I not going to go for it? Or, you know, and, and, and why, really? It gets back to what you were talking about before. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it to please these people? Is it because I love it? Is it because it's further? Like, what is the source of motivation? Which is something I get into with clients all the time. It's not just about high levels of motivation or low levels of motivation. Often it's about the source of motivation. So we mm -hmm. can be very, very motivated by any number of things, some of which are more helpful than others. So that understanding is important. But the the but these these athletes or whomever, they're just used to it coming. Mm -hmm. And and like you mentioned, life happens. Things, things they from one minute to the next we're never the same at from this game to that game to that game something's going to be different in your life and and so what needs to be consistent what needs to be the same is your mental and physical and emotional state prior to and during that particular performance so how do you get there because you can you 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 just need to identify what it is and then have some tools. So that's another thing where we really just start is, okay, but what does right feel like? What does it look like? What is, what is that experience for you? Cause they don't know. They just go do it. And it's always, it's just come easily. So we have to work through, okay, let's develop some awareness around how, how your mind is working and, and how your body is feeling when things are hitting on all cylinders for you. Let's, let's talk about that. And then we start talking about the tools of how to get to that place. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, waiting for just hoping it's going to happen works until it doesn't. And, and again, like we talked about before, that's the differentiating factor for, for sure at the higher levels, but even lower as well. 
I I love what you just said, and I want to highlight what you said about finding what what feels right, what success looks like, and what it feels like to be successful. Because I feel like a lot of times we're con- we're conditioned to think about what's going wrong, right? The athlete comes to you and says, "I just can't. It's not happening for me anymore." And they think that it's the skill, and they forget that you want to focus on what is what is the right thing feel like because that's what we want to we don't want to focus on what's going wrong we want to get past what's going wrong and get back to what's feeling right and that is a huge huge point that i want everybody to make sure they take um let's shift really quickly to your book i want you to talk about your book begin again because i was listening to you on another podcast and you talked about i think it's like a every other day type of thing to read which i really love because i have embarked and i'm sure people out there have embarked on umpteen missions of i'm going to read this every single day i'm going to do this every single day and then every single day just is hard to work out so tell us about your book and if i'm correct that it's like a every other day thing Yeah. I mean, it's, there's certainly no prescriptive, you must do it this way, otherwise you will see no benefit kind of a thing. But yeah, I mean, I just, I put it out there. Sure. This, this would be a useful way to approach this book, this every other day aspect. Um, The book is called Begin Again, Utilize the Wisdom of Eastern and Western Ideologies to Achieve Your Full Potential, which is a mouthful, but really what it comes down to is it's just, it's a book of, personal realizations for me that that came from various sources, both Eastern and Western, because in the morning, one of the things I do in my routine is I have a stack of books and I read them. And some of them are Western philosophy. I'm, I'm working through Marcus Aurelius's meditations again right now. I've done uh, the Bhagavad Gita. I've done um, the Upanishads from the, the Hindu and, and Buddhist world. I have... What else do I have right now? I've got Ryan Holiday, he's a Stoic, modern day Stoic philosopher. Seneca is on, he's also a Stoic philosopher from Roman times. Anyway, I I, I just have a stack of book and it, and it cycles through. There, There's always one, you know, that, that will I'll finish and I'll move it out and replace it with something else. But while I'm reading, I really try to connect what I read to my life. And when I say read, I read just very short pieces of these books, why there are so many (laughs) that are stacked there. I don't have time to read, you know, but I'll read just, you know, a page at most from each book. And whatever the focus is on that page, I try to connect it to my life. And if it's something that's really meaningful, that does connect it, that just lights a spark for whatever reason, I have sticky notes that are there. And I just write on the sticky note what, what it was. Maybe there's a quote associated with the text that, that spoke to me in some kind of way, and I wanted to remember it. So I just write a little note to myself. And those notes, I just, I don't know, I, I, that's what the book is. It's just an expansion of the notes. Each of those essays, and there are 183 of them on purpose, because like you said, that's half of 366, which on a leap year is how many days we have in a year. Uh, But, but each of those 183 essays started as a sticky note that, that, I wrote while while reading. So it really is uh it's just the result of of my own reflection and my own introspection and my own attempts to connect some of the wisdom that exists and there's so much of it from all around the world. Not just not just one one place but but the wisdom throughout the ages. It, to include now, you know, I mean, the, the, the neuroscience you mentioned earlier, it's fascinating what, what we learn about the brain and, and uh, all, all these different. So, I, so yes, to neuroscience now, all the way back to 2,500 years ago when the Buddha was sitting under a tree, uh, it, wisdom throughout, and I try to grasp all of it. And that's really what the book is. So it is my hope is that people will read it and and each of the essays starts with a quote and just be introduced to maybe some some thinkers that they hadn't considered before and 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 identify first because here's the structure of pretty much each essay. Here's a problem, an issue, a challenge that we each tend to face at one point or another. Here's some information that you can use related to that. And now the challenge is go apply this information. 
here are some ways that you can go do that or some questions that might prompt how somebody might apply that information to their lives. So the issue, the information, and then the call to action. What are you going to do with it? And that's each of the essays. The reason that I've suggested like breaking it up, not just every day, but every other day, is to provide time for practice. Practice is important. And some of these concepts are, I don't know, most of these concepts, I would say, are complex. They're deep. They're, they're not just surface level tweets <laughs> that you can ingest uh, very quickly and apply with any kind of usefulness at all. Uh, they, they are concepts that really that need need exploration and and need time to sit with and and to to try out more than once and for more than just a day. Try more than two days too. There's a great case for that, but two days is what it is. I suggested because you know that's what we did. I so love that's the that. Book in a nutshell, that's, that's what I really that's what resonated with me so much is. Um, sometimes you'll have, and, and you, you're so right. What you said at the beginning of that comment is there's actually no right or wrong way to move through knowledge, right? Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but I really like, cause I'm such a type a person that I, if I'm told I'm supposed to do one a day, then I want to do one a day. And I really liked what you had to say about, do you read this essay and apply it and then take another day or so to like play around with it because that way you can actually implement it. Because in my voracious <laughs> consumption of information, especially lately, um, sometimes we like go, oh yeah, that's awesome. And then move on, right? Instead of actually try to implement some of this into our actual self-improvement. And I'm a huge believer in it doesn't have to be leaps and bounds of improvement. In fact, that's not really actually always realistic. Just like, just a, a thousandth of a percent better each day, even if it's an awareness of like, oh, I totally am doing that all the time. Hmm, interesting. And then you have this awareness of things that you are doing as a habit and that puts you on the pathway to perhaps improving that or if it needs improved at all, because sometimes our perception is, oh, I need to fix this about me. And later you find out that it's an asset and you shouldn't have been trying to fix it out of yourself in the first place. So I, I love all of that type of stuff. I actually ordered your book, but I'm a little late now because <laughs> here we are. I, I was just caught up in it once I asked you to join this um, podcast. And uh, I've been on a mission this year of reading more books than I, I want to spend more time reading books than being on social media, which is pretty, you know, easy to do if you're not careful. And so far I have succeeded. I've read a ton of books, including audiobooks, and yours is on the way. So um, we'll include a link to Brian's book, Begin Again, in our show notes, as well as links to where to find Brian and what he's got going on and anything else you want to share, Brian, where people can find you and how they can connect with you. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can find me on Facebook, Begin Again Psychology, Instagram, uh, same thing. Uh, I encourage you to check out the podcast, Poking Holes and Blinders. I don't know, some kind, sometimes Colin and I get it right. And uh, and some of the episodes are are and this is the thing too we are both stunt people but the podcast isn't about stunts it's called poking holes and blinders because it's about trying to consider things from multiple angles the blinders being the rigidity with with which we often look at the world and and exist and and really uh, I don't know just walk around in our everyday environments we have it all figured out and these are the blinders we're missing out on so much and and the purpose of the podcast is really to just bring up even possibly some common topics, but look at them in, in different ways, ways that they haven't been discussed uh, before. So that's that's our intent. So check that podcast out. Sometimes, you know, you might find something that you might like in there. We go, we, I don't know, we hit all kinds of things. So that's one place. And then I have, yeah. I have a feeling that it's a lot better than you're sort of downplaying it because I'm sure it's super interesting. So well, I'm definitely going to yeah. sign up for a subscription <laughs> for that. Colin and I, we have a great time talking to each other. And we have had some really interesting guests on as well with the couple stunt people. We had a uh, public speaking coach on there too. And um, we just, we do, we cover a variety of topics and, and, and just challenge each other, uh, challenge each other to think outside the box. And, and uh, 
just to open our minds up and, and consider things that we haven't considered before. And I, I, both of us believe that that's incredibly important. It's why I read, it's why I write. And, and uh, so, yeah, so that's really what the podcast is. Check it out. I hope you like it. And, um, and that's it. Yeah. Grab, grab the book, get a copy of that, read it. Hope you like that too. I'm, I'm in the process of a volume two for that, as well as, as I mentioned before, two other books on mental strength for entrepreneurs and, uh, uh, probably about a fourth of the way through another book called, at least at the moment, uh, Life Lessons from the Back of a Dirt Bike. So be on the lookout for that one. That one, that one's a fun one to to write. I like more it. Time to do and it. On the coattails of that, I will circle back to what you said about your first book, Begin Again. Just remember out there, if you have an idea for writing a book, it can start as simply as post-it notes, like Brian said. So do not limit yourself. Just get started. Yeah, and and that that reminds me to get back to something you said too about things don't progress in leaps and bounds. Sometimes they do. I mean, sometimes you can see huge huge changes in things, but more often it's incremental change, and often that incremental change is not even noticeable uh, unless you're looking at it from that thirty thousand foot view. I'll, I'll tell you, my my and, and I I'm also a dissertation chair at Grand Canyon University. So I have dissertation students, PhD students who are working through their dissertations. And I know from my dissertation when I was doing it, and this is guidance I provide to my students as well, is I had a, a picture of an elephant with a bite taken out of it with, you know, the, the saying being, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Well, I just, you know, I wrote dissertation on the elephant. So that's what it was. And it's just one bite at a time, one sentence, you know, one sentence, one paragraph, one section. That's what you do. So it's little bits at a time. If you just sit down and work a little bit, and I've listened to the same thing recently in other podcasts about authors, just in general, successful authors, they will limit their time to two hours, maybe, and no more of writing, but they're writing for those two hours and they're doing it every day. So there's the, it's the consistency this, that that's what gets you there. You know, the tortoise and the hare. It's, you know, Aesop had it right. However many thousands of years ago that happened. <laughs> My five on all of that as well. Thank you again so much, Brian, for being here. And you guys just remember, if you feel stuck, you probably need someone with different perspective to help you navigate that stuck place. So Brian is somebody that you can reach out to, to help you get unstuck and optimize your performance. So thanks again for being here with us. Yep. Check it out. Begin again, performance psychology.com. Thank you so much. And, and awesome. thank you, Rachel, for letting me come on and talk. I've had a great time with this conversation. Huge pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you.